So welcome to this talk on optimizing review workflows with Hugo. My name is Chris Weverly. I'm a product manager on the Nuke team at Foundry. Happy to introduce Hugo and let him go through all the amazing stuff he has for us today. OK. Well, thank you so much for coming. Much appreciated. I'm really happy to see a full house here. And I'm uh, incredibly happy to be here again so after all these years of pandemic and being home and watching streaming. Now we can actually be together in the same room. So yeah, much appreciated being here on such a sunny day. So um, I'm going to like uh, basically start with a small introduction. Um, my name is Hugo Guerra. Uh, I'm a director and a visual effects supervisor. I also do silly photos, as probably people noticed already. Um, I wanted to also to take the opportunity to thank the Foundry, uh, not because I'm just a fanboy of the Foundry, but I also like I want to thank them for the, you know, from my heart, all the support they always give me. They always bring me to these things. It's because of them that we can do this. So I want just a round of applause to the Foundry. Thank you. So. Without further ado, before we even start, I want to just get this out of the way. I always do a 360 photo with, with, with everyone that I do. This is the one I did from last, no, this is from two years, I think. So you're happy to do a 360 photo with me? Yeah. Right, oh, like they're waiting for it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to just like get in, squeeze into the middle here. And uh, I'll just go in here so I don't bother everyone. So don't, don't remember. This takes really, really short amount of time, and you won't remember anything after this. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so. Be sure that you see the lens, okay? So if you don't see one of these lenses, either this one or that one, you're not gonna be in the photo. So make sure you, uh, you can clean or do whatever you want, but make sure you see a lens, okay? So let's just say cheese. Cheese. And one for safety when we say on. Okay, thank you so much. You'll see it later on Instagram and Twitter and everywhere. <laughs> okay, cool. With this out of the way, we can all go home. With this in mind, let me just talk about what I'm going to talk to you about today. I know the title is a bit weird, you know, optimizing the VFX review workflow lessons from the supervisors. But the whole point of my talk really is for us to kind of like learn to be a bit better artists. And I always find when I'm talking with artists and students and beginners and juniors that they don't know that perhaps 50% of our work is managing dealing with clients, dealing with other artists, and actually only 50% is on the box. So with that, you know, I'm going to make a simpler title for my talk. I would just say that we just have to be better. That's the whole point of this talk. And by the end, I hope that you kind of learn some of the tricks that I've collected over the years. Uh, I'm going to be talking pretty much about the pipeline that I've been developing for the last 12 years. Uh, and but. How did it all started, really? I mean, this is me when I was seven, uh, seven years old, and I promise that I will be very, very quick on my small introduction of what I've done so far. And it is relevant to what I'm gonna discuss because this is why I got to the place where I am now in terms of reviewing and handling clients. So I'm originally from Portugal. Uh, I'm, I actually was born in Porto. My father, when I was six, asked me if I wanted a bicycle or a computer. You can probably bet what I picked. I picked the computer. This computer is only 120, uh, 28 kibytes of memory, by the way, which allows you to have these photo real graphics. I mean, I, at least I thought it was for real. Years later, I go to art school because back then there was no such thing as a visual effects course. So I did a fine uh, a, a degree in fine arts, in painting of everything. And I developed my love for cinema. Loved cinema, mostly was obsessed by Eisenstein, obsessed by Kubrick, obsessed by David Cronenberg, by David Lynch, and by David Fincher, the three Davids. It's really funny that they all called David. Started learning After Effects 3.1. That was the first thing, sorry, Foundry. That was the first thing I ever used when I was very, very young. I was like a lad, 17 years old. And I actually, when I was 18, I did a, a film. I actually did a, the first ninja movie of Portugal. And it's one of the worst films in the world. I'm going to show you a little clip of it. You can't find it on the internet. You can try it. So I was 18. I did this. It's a crap film. It's shit. Tell you, you're not going to like it. It doesn't matter. But it's so bad that it becomes good. But what I've learned with this film was that I started filming and editing. And I was 18, remember? That's why it looks so good. 
I even went to national TV to present it because it actually was broadcast on national TV in Portugal. This is, uh, this is me when I was like, I was uh, 20, I think I was 19 or 20 here, I think so. Anyway, all about that. Go back to the software I've learned. So I learned After Effects 3.1, compositing, learned Photoshop 5 at the time, and I guess I know VFX, right? I'm like, okay, it's all good. I know everything, I can do anything. I'm a master of After Effects and Photoshop. I did forget about this. I forgot that, again, like I said in the beginning, 50% of our time is handling clients, crisis, and budget meetings, and all the other shenanigans that have to do with reviews and handling a client and tell them to piss off or tell them that they shouldn't have that and that. But anyway, years later, I worked on all these companies over the last 20 years. Animec, Nexus, The Mill, Fire That Smoke, uh, uh, Sony Studios, uh, you know, Rebellion Studios and Hugo's Desk. Worked on with a bunch of clients. Spent most of my time on set, scratching my head, trying to solve problems, looking like a fool with spheres and college charts. No one knew what the hell I was doing. And developing a lot of gray hairs in the middle of all of this. Basically, for each gray hair is for each problem that I had in visual effects. And did, you know, lately I've been mostly known for doing a lot of game cinematics and trailers. These are some of the games that I worked on. Last one I did was Sniper Elite, which was the talk I did last year. And then I'll plug it that you can watch the talk from last year on my YouTube channel, which is now published there. I also teach a lot, and I really would advise you all to try to go as to as many festivals as possible, just like this FMX festival. This is advice to you so that you can learn with other artists, so that you can mingle with those artists and also go to the recruitment booths to try to get yourself a new job. I teach a lot and mostly people kind of know me as the nuke guy, but actually I teach a lot of things and including I teach photography for visual effects and cinematography for visual effects because I am a true believer of core skills and there are much more things to learn besides just the, the software. I believe really in agnosticism so that you can learn other things. From there, from Portugal, I moved to Sweden, worked on a, on a company doing a lot of CG, learned Shake 3, sorry, Foundry, then looked at Shake 3, then I learned Combustion 2. I'm just like trying to show you how agnostic this industry is because you learn so many different things. By the way, these are real boxes that I have collected over the years. I collect old software. So if you have old software, send it my way because I got collected. And then I think the turning point was Final Cut 3. Final Cut 3, rest in peace. It was a, a pivotal moment because this was the moment that I started doing my own editing and other people's editing. And at the moment that I started doing editing, that's the moment that I started getting involved on the conversation. This is what I wanted to transmit to all of you today, that editing, conforming, and reviewing is part of the process to make you more involved in the process than just being a composter or a 3D artist. At this stage also, 17 years ago, I started learning Nuke as well. By then, Nuke was not even from the Foundry yet, it was from D2, from Digital Domain, and this is how Nuke used to look like, you know, 17 years ago. I'm really old, I'm sure some people in this room are 17 years, um, so it makes me just more depressed. This is how it looked like, We've evolved quite a lot since then. Um, and again, I know composting, right? I must be ready now because I know all these things. Well, I don't know. So I got myself packed up, went to London. In London, worked at Nexus, did a bunch of CG commercials. I got to like the reputation of being the guy that did CG over there. I don't know why that happened. I guess I was the only one that knew Nuke at the time. Most people was using Shake. Get a job at the mill, started working at the mill as a composter. This is me young at the mill, that's the mill behind. Uh, and then this is the first moment that I start experiencing this. Start experiencing the clients next to us, sitting with us in the review sessions and trying to handle being a social creature besides being a composter, also having to deal with people around you. And no matter how much alcohol I consumed, it did not matter because it was always a disaster. This was the Nuke department. I later became the head of Nuke, uh, uh, the head of composting at the mill in London. And I was very proud of a moment that was a turning point, which was when we got, you know, the mill is famous for just having flame suites for clients. You know, clients come in, they have a flame suite, they pretend it's all amazing, it's all real time, but in fact, there's people in the background rendering and doing things. And I was very happy that 
we finally got a studio, a, 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 basically a, a suite with Nuke. At the time it wasn't Nuke Studio, it was running Hero. Actually, we started with something called Breakaway. Probably you don't know, but New, uh, Hero used to be called Breakaway at the very, very beginning when it first came out. And so I was very proud of the fact that we had the first studio. That meant that I had direct contact with clients. I could sit with them, explain things, check plates, try to solve problem and doing problem solving right there with the conform and the editorial parts of the projects. Again, I'm gonna go fast because I wanna get into the presentation. I then did a productions while I was there. I, these are just a few of them. I did like trailers for Body Count, like this is a really old trailer. I comped the whole thing by myself with three other 3D artists. I did like the award-winning uh, How the Hummingbird as well while I was there. I brought this commercial synthesis with uh, the German uh, football team. Figured it would be relevant since I'm in Germany. So I did this as well. We did a bunch of the commercials, but uh, I like particularly this one where he's a ninja. He's not a ninja anymore, but he used to be. <laughs> but uh, at, all the, at all of this time, I also developed more and more my gaming background because I love video games. I've always been a huge gamer. So whenever the mill had a project about games, I would always stuck in. And so I ended up being the lead composer in London for the Call of Duty Ghosts cinematics, in-game cinematics. The game, the game is not good, but let's forget about the game. Let's just like watch the cinematics. And, and I'm a huge gamer. I've always loved games. And I think the games industry always have permitted me to have a lot of hats, try to do editing and grading and composting. In fact, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I probably play too, too much games. In fact, I just finished the Elden Ring. And, and actually, I, I put 200, uh, 173 hours on this thing. I actually platinum Elden Ring. I was so happy about that. So like, yeah, it was an achievement. It took me like three months to do that, you know, because we have a life. But hey, I did it. It's there. I have proof of it. It's my only platinum. Uh, and so I was the king of Elden Ring. And never mind. So going back to the commercials, then I did really crazy commercials. I just put this one here because this has spandex on it. And I just felt that it's a really funny commercial to put on, on reels because people always have a laughter. The, 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 the horse is real, by the way. It's a, a real tiny horse that we filmed with. We then did a lot of commercials also for Samsung. Uh, I brought this particular one because this was the first one that we actually fully edited inside of Nuke Studio, at the time called Hero. And, and then finally, the last project I ever did at the mill was the BBC God Only Knows, which also, again, I was very involved on set. I was on set for a year. Then I kind of like did the conform and kind of with the editing team at the mill. And so for, again, being very involved, I'll show you in the slides in a, in a minute how my pipeline operates in terms of bringing the shots in, reviewing, previewing, all those things. I left the mill then, basically left the mill, left the mill because of a number of reasons. One of the reasons being this, I was so fed up of this, of having every day to spend like an hour inside trains. And I also very, was very fed up of having to be in the same room as these people trying to do all of this. So, I've been working from home for seven years now, even before the pandemic hit. And so I started working from home. At the time, it was not, it was frowned upon. People didn't really like that people would work from home. And I can tell you that working from home is not, not this. Uh, I wish it was something like this. I saw this the other day on the net. I thought this was fascinating that someone would live like this. It's just a bit weird, isn't it? The guy also looks like a ninja. But actually, Working from home for me right now in 2023 looks more like this. This is my studio at, uh, at my house, and it's like a multi-purpose studio, really. It's a combination of multiple studios that I had during my career at The Mill, at Nexus, at Fire Dot Smoke, at Sony. So it, it kind of can do grading, it also can do editing, it also can do new composting, it also can do streaming, Twitch, gaming, it does all of those things. So it's kind of like a, a very, optimized workflow that I've created here, which I, again, I have a, an entire keynote about this setup that is now on Hugo's desk on my YouTube channel. That I, that's the, the talk I did here last year, exactly on this room, actually, exactly a year ago. You can go and check that. And my entire pipeline, since I've left the mill and since I've been working remotely, has been revolving around these pieces of software. Basically, Nuke Studio, Nuke Studio for conforming, Redshift for rendering, Nuke for composting, Maya for CG, Photoshop for because we have to, there's no other way. And then F-Track for management, Zoom and Dropbox, uh, for Zoom for calls, and of course Dropbox for the server Dropbox business. Then Udini, and then uh, this software here, sorry. 
um, as well. Um, anyway, so then I went into the first project I ever did, which was completely remote. This was the first one that I did in 2014. This was uh, starting Martin Starr. It was a short film called Man in Slow Motion, which uh, the name says it all. It's a guy in slow motion and everyone else is not in slow motion. That's pretty much it. Then I went up and did another short film, which was another, which also was completely remote as well. And this time it was called Baby Teeth, where people take out their teeth so that they look younger. I hope that never happens ever because it's absolutely horrendous. And, but hey, never say never, right? I mean, maybe it will happen someday and people remove their teeth to make them look nicer. But it's just like, uh, I just, yeah. Anyway, so because I really want to jump into the workshop bit of this presentation, um, I want to just show you my showreel. Now, I, we don't have time to show showreel, so I'm going to show you my 29 second long showreel of all the work that I've directed lately in the last 12 years. This is my 29 second showreel. I'm the top star, I'm Okay, cool. So you get the picture, right? It's like work. <laughs> By the way, I just wanted to make sure everyone here in this room listens that you should not do a showreel like that, okay? <laughs> just want to make sure you don't go to the recruitment booth and do a fast forward showreel. Do not do that, okay? This is just a joke. Um, anyway, I have to just put a disclaimer. So let's talk about how I've been doing my projects over the last years, and that's the, the whole, I guess that's the point while you're here. It all starts with my project setting, and by the way, I have the help of my AI assistant here to tell you some stuff as well. And the whole point of this is that usually it starts with you bringing in the assets into, into the timeline. And of course, I, what, I, what I wanted to emphasize is that the, the turning point for me was when I had access to the raw material, the actual raw plates. And this meant that using Nuke Studio, uh, you can use other softwares, of course, but using Nuke Studio, it allowed me to bring in the ADL and actually have access to all the footage. And what did this do? This allowed me to actually start developing these timelines where I would have all the plates from the actual shoot, because this has been always something that the editors have access to. But usually, normally, compositors don't have access to. Many, many years at the mill, I worked on projects where there was a, a specific take that they didn't use, the editor didn't pick, that actually had a, a clean area that I could have used for a cleanup, you know? And so a lot of times I was doing jobs at the mill without even knowing that there were other takes or other plates that could have helped me. And this was really a turning point. Then the other phase as well, once I've established a full timeline which is matching the offline from the editor, I then of course just check if everything is working, you know, check if it's matching, with the offline, and basically from this moment on, I start then optimizing my workflow by naming each track to whatever plate it is. So let's say, let's say track number one is the background, track number two is the foreground, track number three is the extra plate, the cleanup, or maybe track number five is the HDR. So with that in mind, I started then building a pipeline through this naming convention. At the same time also, just make sure you always line it up with the offline so that you make sure that you also handle all of the speed ramps and maybe slow motion shots that you might have in your timeline. Because this is gonna be crucial for the visual effects because if you have a very long shot, you might be doing VFX for nothing. This is also something that used to happen to me a lot. And then also I would really advise you to start developing a pipeline where you are able to backtrack anything. So for example, if the editor has chosen to do shot one, two, three, four, five, I stick with his naming convention so that I, when I talk with, with the director, or if I talk with the producer, or if I talk with the client, I can tell them shot three and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. So it's, it's a matter of you backtracking and making sure everything is named accordingly so that when you're in a review session, you can go all the way back to the raw plate, but also all the way front to the final render so that you have everything living on one single timeline. 
Of course, like I said, this is, a, this is the same thing as you saw before, but this is on another project. I usually tend to use the, the track names to develop my naming convention uh, to do the tracks. And this also allowed me then to use another thing that the editors have been hiding for me for years, which is other plates. You know, a lot of times I was in projects where I discovered later on that there was clean plates and there was grain plates and there were flares and I never got them because I was never, I was never told that they exist. So that was another reason why I really highly recommend everyone starting to be involved on the timeline that they're working for. So if you're working on a company, develop interest into that timeline. Go and, go and meet the editor of the company. Buy him a coffee, you know, like start talking to him or, she, or her, start talking to them and just see what happens to see if you can have access to more plates. From this moment on, then, I mean, at this stage, we then use the track naming convention in New Studio to build the timeline and to build the folder structure. This is just an example and you need to follow this exact example I have here. But this is a very typical naming convention where I have the name of the project and I have shot number, shot one, shot two, shot three. Then I have the types of tracks that we have like foreground, background, grain plate, green screen, like green screen, grids, all those things. And then you develop like a pipeline for all of the shots. And again, an ability to backtrack everything that you've been working on. And to that, uh, and, 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 and also, at that stage, that's the stage that then you output all these plates because obviously when they're shot, they're usually shot on RAW or they're actually usually shot on a format that you can't really easily read inside of Nuke. And I've seen a lot of mistakes made by artists by them loading the Blackmagic format into Nuke or loading the whatever fo RAW format of their Sony camera in directly into Nuke. And sometimes either it breaks or it doesn't work because the color space is not correct or it just doesn't, is not optimized to be done inside of Nuke because again, Nuke is mostly, should be mostly used with EXRs. And so this is what we call a conform uh, area. The other thing as well that I started developing while I was being involved into the conversation was that I got to see all the plates the facility has. Because a lot of times the company has a lot of plates leftovers from other productions. They have stock footage, they have B cameras from another production, or maybe a take of a sunset or whatever they might have from other plates. And I would really recommend you to start using bins and start really categorizing and, and actually gathering all these things. Then I'm gonna move into the editorial pipeline. Again, this notion of backtracking and always having access to everything from the beginning. My editorial pipeline kind of starts by having an animatic. For example, this is just cost three trailer that I directed. So basically we have an animatic, a boardomatic, and even the boards and the animatic share the same names of the shots. So it's board shot one, board shot two. So that when I backtrack, I can actually very easily go back to all the way to the beginning of the project. And this was a pivotal moment because when I'm on a client meeting and when the client says, oh, but this is not what the shot we should be doing, then I can backtrack all the way to the animatic and say, no, this is the animatic, you know, you're just lying to me. This is the animatic that we agreed upon. And again, you know, of course, the other advantage or disadvantage, I would say, of having access to an editorial pipeline through your VFX projects is of course that you end up doing a lot of versions. Uh, and this is just a small example of some of the versions we did on one single project. And sometimes it kind of freaks you out, but it's, it's, it's okay. The other thing as well that I wanted to emphasize is that when you're doing an animatic and sharing with the client, because again, remember what I was saying, talking to your client is a skill on its own. So a lot of times when I do these animatics, when I'm creating these projects, I share versions of these animatics that include reference plates and they include inspirational plates so that I can start having a discussion and a conversation with my client about what we want to try to achieve on a shot. What we would you like that shot to look like? That's kind of the turning point. Now, let's move on to the next thing that I want to discuss, which is the review aspect of all of this. Now, there are two types of reviews. You have the review with your team, 
but you also have the review with the client. And I really wanted you to start thinking about the fact that they are very different from each other. So the review with the team is usually a Zoom call or a Skype call where we're just ch chatting. And I really would like to emphasize the fact that you ever, if you ever are in a position of working as a lead or as a supervisor in a project, make sure you give the space for all the artists on the project to tell you what they think, to share in brainstorm shots, to try to everyone collaborate. I try as best as I can to have a huge collaboration on a project because I truly believe that the more collaboration exists between the team, the better. And that's what we tend to do with these, with these calls that we have usually on a daily basis. Also, never forget the water cooler moment. You should always try to have, and of course, I don't have a photo of the water cooler at the mill, but that was the place where gossip existed. You know, we would talk about what was happening in the company. Who's dating who? This producer is a prick. That producer is nice. You know, we would say all those things on the water cooler. So try to develop a water cooler moment. You just like chat. And then you move on to the, to the review. Now, I wanted to do a few advices regarding the review. There's always a moment on the review that the first shot, you start doing way too much feedback on just the first shot. So just try to avoid those kind of things. This is what we in the industry called pixel fudging, that we usually call. So, and try to not be on a position where you're spending way too much time debating or discussing something that no one will ever see, ever, okay? Just wanted to like start implement, like start telling people that we, it's okay, we can, we can relax a bit. The shots don't have to be perfect at one, at 800% pixel. I just hope that everyone starts kind of like, start thinking about that. The other thing as well that I would say is that sometimes we end up on these reviews looping way too much. And have you ever seen a film in loop? Because I haven't. No one really sees films in loops. Obviously, it's, it's important for you to loop a shot to understand what the, the, how it looks, but just try to minimize that as well. And again, I'm just saying these things because I'm just trying to, to say the pros and cons of a review session. That's pretty much it. Then, of course, there's the, the, the other aspect of it, which is when you're doing notes and you're all together. It's very important for you to draw on the screen and try to have as much as not. Bring in the reference. Bring the whole team into the session. This is with the team. And I try to have this every day. I would really recommend you to force yourself to have these kind of talks with your team because this is what used to happen when we were at the office. I know no one is at the office these days. But people, when they used to be at the office, they would walk in to the desk of someone and they would talk to someone and point at it and then chat about it and then move away and then go to the next desk. We don't do those things anymore. And I would really emphasize that you should probably do that more often. And we can do that. We can share our screens. We can do all those things while we are doing Zoom calls or Skype calls. With all of this, now we get ready for the client session. Now, the client session is a different beast, and I'm going to give you some advices of how to handle that session when you're talking with either the director of the project, or you're talking with producers, or people that are going to be the ones paying for the project. So first of all, of course, I would really advise you to always load up all the versions of the project. The reason I say this is that, well, you want to load all this, the versions so that you can then pick which ones you are actually going to show to the client. Because it's really important for you to understand the client is going to be extremely confused by subtle little changes on a shot. If the shot only has like a minute 0.5% change on luminance, they're never going to understand what the hell happened there. You have to consider the client is like your parents, okay? They don't know anything about this because most of the times they don't. And so you have to really make sure you pick versions that really change from version to version. And then when you go into the client session, and by the way, this is a real client session. I've made it speed it up, of course. So this entire session, for example, as you can see, I'm doing it at 1,000 speed, just so you understand how slow this takes. It takes hours sometimes. But you see, notice how few versions I'm showing. And I'm always showing it at full screen. I never show interfaces. I never show Nuke. Never show the timeline. I just show the full frame 
of the shot. The reason for that is because that is the only thing they care. They don't care how you did it. They don't care what funky node you used, what crazy gizmo you're using. They don't even know what you're talking about. If you say gizmo to them, they'll just say, what is that? It's like a drink or something? They don't even understand. So you need to like really understand that they are a different type of audience. And this is really what it is. It's an audience. And so I treat it as an audience. The other thing I really wanted to emphasize is, for the love of of God, do not use spreadsheets on the visual effects pipeline. We need to like stop this madness because I still see people using this. I would really highly recommend for you to switch to either F-Track or to ShotGrid or to any other application that is actually built for that purpose. And the reason for that is because while you do your sessions with your clients or even you're doing your sessions with your artists, this is the best place for you to make notes and have a record of what happened. And it's incredibly important to have a record because the next time the client says, I didn't say that, then you have a record that yes, they said that. And it's important, and I'm not saying to be a confrontation, I'm just saying to say, no, no, I remember that on the 17th of March at 3.15, you said that. And you make it a bit funky and funny and hey, start laughing. And then you will see, oh yeah, I did say that. In fact, some of these softwares like AfTrack and and ShotGrid, especially AfTrack, which I've been using for a long time, again, you even can make the entire pipeline directly from the software into the AfTrack interface. So in this case, you saw it there that I had the timeline of Nuke Studio, and then I can basically pick up the timeline, import it all to F-Track, and then it divides all the shots and naming conventions and matches it with Nuke Studio. So then when I have all my assets and I'm doing all my reviews, everything is matching, and again, I backtrack everything to the very beginning. Now, for all of this, client sessions and uh, dealing with your artists and dealing with other people that you're working with, let's just take a moment to talk about webcams. I, I, I know this is a stupid comment and it's a stupid idea, but I really, I sh- actually think, you know, think about this. We used to be on the office, right? And which means we were like in Chris clear. We could see each other. We could see our mouths. We could see our faces. We could see our expressions. Try your hardest not to do this, to have like the worst webcam in history to try to do a call and also maybe try to check if your internet connection can work. This is me at the hotel last night. By the way, the hotel has some of the worst internet in the world. So that's how that looked like. So I would advise you to try to up your game of review, you know? And I'm not saying that you need to buy my setup, okay? My setup is is not what you should do because it's exaggerated. Think of it as a, uh, an inspiration to do better. That's it. Don't, don't buy this because I bought this because I do streams. But for example, my setup for review when my client, when I'm doing with my clients and my, and my, and my artists, I use uh, an AT Mini extra, ex, ex, Extreme ISO because I'm broadcasting. I think of my sessions like if they were a TV show, like if I was actually doing a live broadcast for my client. So I'm using a broadcast system to do it. This way I can have my webcam, which I'm basically, by the way, I'm using, my webcam is basically that camera, which is the Blackmagic 6A. Not saying you should get a camera like that to do a webcam, but you surely can get something better. And even if you don't have a good webcam, you can at least get more light so that the webcam behaves better. And I'm saying this because remember when you used to do client sessions, you would not come in with all ragged and all dirty and all like with your hair like this, right? You would take a bit of time to at least be presentable to your clients. So think of the webcam as a, a, an image of you. You know, you're presenting yourself to the world. You should look at least a little bit better when you're presenting. That will ev- elevate your confidence to try to talk with your clients because some of them really care about these things. I don't, but they do. And so you should think about that because a lot of people in the world think about appearances. I'm sorry, that's how it goes. So this kind of setup allows me then to have my webcam. It also allows me to then have, I can stream just my desktop if I want to, or if I want, I can stream just my Blackmagic video out so that I can either stream 
my desktop if I need to really show something, like a reference, for example, or I can stream a video output signal to the client in full screen. And hey, I can even put myself in the little corner while I'm talking. It's almost like I, I make a Twitch stream for them. You know, I'm like, like presenting to them as if I was on Twitch presenting to my followers when I'm doing. And clients really appreciate that because they find it that it's like really slick and it's professional and they, they remember those kind of things. So, and with this in mind, do you really think that, you know, it doesn't really cost more? Of course, this is obviously too much. You know, this is like a really expensive camera. The only reason why I'm using it for as a webcam is because sincerely, like, I had it on my desk, might as well use it, you know? So that's the kind of way. Now, a second thing I wanted to share with you, and this is what I usually do when I'm reviewing with my clients when I'm not doing a live stream. So imagine if they can't be on a call, we can't get together. What I then do is I do a keynote presentation to send to them because an email will not suffice. I would not advise you to just send an email with a link and say, here's shot 10 for you to see. No, so here's an example of what I usually do. This is, for example, the first one I did. I'm gonna just scroll through it so that you can see what I mean. So these are like full keynote presentations where I show the client inspirations of what I had on the project. I show them rough animatics. I show them rough renders of where we are. And then I kind of show them the latest compositing, some crazy ideas. And at the same time, I'm explaining in audio what I'm showing. And I can tell you that every single cinematic that I've directed so far, I've won the pitch because of a keynote like this. Because when I'm sending the pitch over, I don't send the PDF. I send the full keynote presentation of me talking through the references, through the shots, and even through the examples. Here's another example of it. This was for Gran Turismo, for a trailer that we were doing. This is the look and feel keynote that we developed. And as you can see, I'm talking on it. I'm going to just share with you the sound for a little bit. This will drive, you see if you can see on these examples, the cars switch, the tracks change, light weekend. You see, you get the picture. I'm basically telling them, okay, this is what we're aiming for. This is the type of project we might want to achieve. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Ever since I started doing this for the last 10 years, I get less questions, I get less changes, I get less of everything. The same thing for, oh, I'm just going to show another one and then we're going to move on to the next one. Um, so, you know, this one here, I'm busy, sorry. This one here, I'm presenting like really rough, rough animatics, for example. I'm presenting even rougher animatics. I'm presenting like just boredomatics, really. At some point also, I even sometimes send them, send them references of what, for example, this was for the Heroes Arena. I wanted it to have a Kung Fu feel. So then I sent them a bunch of shots of what staging and angles we could use for the, for the thing. And then you get an approval because then you get like an email back saying, yeah, we don't like that shot, but we like this one. So let's copy this one. Let's mix this one with that one. And, and, it, and they feel much more involved. Anyway, moving on, we are now on the final phase of the presentation. Attached to all of this, the reviewing the timeline and also the conforming and also dealing with your clients and showing them keynotes, all the things that you just saw. There's also another phase of the project which I really, really enjoy because it really scratches that itch that I love about grading. I'm not a colorist, by no means I'm not a colorist, but I try my best to do my own color or at least my pre-color. And that is another thing that we really enjoy. Most of the times we end up having the comp, you know, this is the final comp, which is like a really massive composite that takes forever to render. No matter how much you, you optimize it, it's always gonna take several minutes to render or several hours or half an hour. And so in fact, it's actually almost impossible to grade something like this, this heavy. So what we started doing on my company and with my team is we then did the comp on top of the comp. So we have the comp, we render the comp in EXR for the 2-bit float, maybe render some passes like some IDs and some depth and some simple passes. So we, it's almost like a pre-render, but this is a pre-render done in EXR for the 2-bit float. And from there, we then grade on top. So then we do a second comp 
In this case, I'm using the function in Nuke Studio, which is called make comp, which you can develop like a, a comp directly from the timeline. And then we do like simpler composites with just some grade nodes or some color correctors. And these comps, because they are so small and they're so simple, they often play back in real time. So that means I can actually sustain an actual real time session with the client. And in, in a way, this is a bit like what Flame used to do years ago. People have this idea that Flame is all in real time, but the fact of the matter, what used to happen is that they would pre-render certain parts and there were other parts and sections that would be attached to each other to make the shots. And there would be like a preparation phase to make the shots viable for you to show them to your client. And so no one wants to sit with the client and have Nuke open and wait for the scan line to go down for one frame. The client is going to going to flip out. They're going to look at that and think, oh my God, this is going to take 20 years to do this project. They want to have a quick and easy feedback loop. But because you're preserving the 32-bit float and you're preserving certain aspects of the image, you can still grade on top. And then if you do, if you need to do a really, really uh, extreme change, you can always go back to the comp and then render just that part and then go back to the pre-comp or the after comp? I don't know. What's the name? The post comp? Yeah, the post comp. Look, we just invented the term. The post comp. And I want to leave you with this. This is, the, this is actually a, a real recording of when I graded. This is the other cool thing about having that system that I broadcast, the ATM Express. I now tend to record while I'm working for several reasons. One of the reasons, of course, is to do breakdowns like you're seeing here, because then I can show you on this session what I've done. The other reason is, well, I, I find it fascinating to find out how many hours it took me to do a shot. And the only reason to know how many hours it took me to do a shot, the only way is really to record it so that I can have a timer for it. And it's been really cool to actually know, oh, that shot took 17 hours. Oh, that shot, 27. Oh, this only took three. It's fascinating to start understanding that because after a while, you start really kind of like knowing exactly how long a shot takes because of this information. Anyway. This is like just, because I can't bring you all to my Nuke Hugo's desk studio, um, because you know, you wouldn't fit. I then recorded all of the screens that I have there. So I have basically there my desktop, which is Nuke, running Nuke. Then in here, down here, I have my Blackmagic video out, running a 10-bit signal from Nuke's out, video out. And then in here, I have as real hardware scopes, which I've captured for you to see. And the scopes are really the important part. Besides having a color calibrated monitor, of course, but the scopes are a methodology for you to really understand the values of images. But this is kind of the process. I always have these three windows open. My desktop, my full video, full screen, and then my scopes. So that I can actually, when I'm doing a grading decision or a compositing decision, I know exactly if I'm under a correct value, if I'm with legal values, and all those things. Anyway, I've talked for way too long. Let's just wrap this thing up. I'm going to do a little bit of a shameless promotion here. It goes without saying, if you have not subscribed to my channel, please do, uh, my Hugo's Dex channel. Also, you can, if you want to know more about my stuff, just follow me on Twitter, Hugo Sigara on Twitter, Hugo's Desk on Twitter as well. You can also, if you want, listen to my uh, VFX Notes podcast, which I do with Ian Fells from Before and Afters. Uh, we were really proud of it. We just reached 500,000 views, which is like half a million views. We're really happy with that. And of course, if you like good food, you can check uh, my YouTube channel from my wife, Anna, which makes amazing vegetarian vegan food. It's called Green Recipes for All. Uh, so it's really good food. Um, I get to eat it and film it. Um, and the videos look really nice. They're in 4K. They're done in ACES with color correction. It's the, the most ridiculous setup to do a video on YouTube for food using ACES and 12-bit and 10-bit. It's just preposterous. But hey, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and that's it. And if you want to know more about Nuke, I have a Nuke course, uh, which you can sign up to. It has over 2,000 students. We have a huge community, a very diverse community. We have 80 countries that are part of my course. I guess I just say, what have I learned since 99? I'll put the QR code again. Don't worry, I'll put the QR code again. What have I learned since 1999? 
nothing. I just know that I know nothing and I really, really advise you that anything you do, just continue to learn more and more like I have been doing because this is a ever shifting industry, okay? So with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks I for the- I uh, finished in time. Unbelievable, this is the first for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I timed it for half an hour. I miserably failed. <laughs> yes, Thanks so. for the awesome talk, <laughs> super funny. Uh, you seem to be really, really um, productive. So can you tell us what's a typical day in your life? So I have a twin brother and he's the one that works <laughs> and I'm just the one that talks, you know, no, I'm joking. Um, yeah, I know that's a problem for me. That's a, definitely a problem. I work from home and I work way too much, that's for sure. But um, I would say that ever since I started working from home, I do work more hours per day. I think I sometimes work never eight. It's always like 10, 12. But what I do is like I do stop several days. So. Sometimes I just take a week off, or sometimes I just take five days off, or sometimes I take a month off. So, <coughs> what I've learned ever since I've been working on my own company and working with my team is that I never take two jobs at the same time. I only take one at a time, and when I'm done, I take a break between them. That's been my, my solution for this. And so it looks like I'm very productive, but in fact, I actually feel I'm not very productive. I am not at all. But it looks like that because I showed you a lot of work that I've been doing for many years, you know, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for the awesome talk. Um, it's always fun to go back to FMX and, like, see you perform for over an hour. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, my question would be, like, um, you mentioned, in the, I think, pretty early, uh, the workflow where you, like, pull all the plates um, in Nuke Studio, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what will happen when the when the editor ed, um, when the editor um, um, changes, changes something? The changes something. Like um, in the perfect world, there's a picture look, you know, but something changes um, and you get like uh, um, more frames in the back or after yeah. a shot. So what I'm will happen? I'm glad you said that. I forgot to mention that. I think you know I wasn't looking at my notes. I should have. But um, I always we use always in the industry we use something called handles. So when we have a shot, imagine the shot is 100 frames. I set like 10 frame handles, so you have 10 extra frames at the end and 10 extra frames at the beginning, so that the editor can still squeeze a few frames here and there. If it's beyond those 10 frames, then I'm afraid you have to conform that shot again. And usually that happens a lot, and what we do is we get a new XML from the client, and then we conform just that section, and then we re-export just that shot with a new uh, time frame. But the trick here is to conform starting on 1001, because that means you can go backwards. Because if you start in one, you can't go to negative frames. But if you start in 1001, if the, if the editor decides to go to 700, you can still squeeze down and have the numbers still working on your timeline and still working inside of Nuke and inside the editorial. You know. Um, sorry for the um, for the question. Um, do you have like? You have a... to pay for the second one. I'm... Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> I got your PayPal, so it's it's all right. Uh, <laughs> um, do you have like a workflow or script that? Uh, detects all the changes that maybe was remaining? I do, yes, I do. I, I, this is something I forgot to advise as well. Uh, I am terrible at coding because I'm an artist. You know, you saw I have a fine art degree. I, I know nothing about coding or Python. So what I do is I hire coders to do things for me. So, so I actually hire, hire a, a programmer, um, a professional programmer, to build my pipeline, and often I bring them in to do updates to that pipeline, especially when they update Nuke, and then I have to do it again. So that happens very often, especially when we switched from, I believe it was 12 to 13, or 11 to 12, something like that. That was a, exactly, that was a massive change. I had to redo the whole pipeline. But that's, that's kind of what I would advise to you. Anyone in this room that doesn't know how to do coding, just get friendly with the coder, and then maybe either get friendly with them or hire them. I hire them, didn't get friendly with them, yes. Thanks. Okay, great, any other questions? I think we can handle one, maybe two more. Oh, yeah. You'll pass it. <laughs> Hello, Guerrero. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, oh, I, I just wanted Gero, to... I like that. That's nice, Mr. Guerrero. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah um, I just wanted to ask you just a funny question. Do you use ChatGPT for your uh, scripting your videos on YouTube? Do I what? Do you use ChatGPT for uh, work purposes, for the workflow maybe? No, I don't, no. No, I don't use AI on my 
stuff yet. No, I mean, I, I, uh, I, mean, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm still kind of checking and waiting. You can come to my talk, like my panel at uh, 5. We're going to talk a lot about AI on that panel because that's one of the topics. We have five topics we're going to talk. I don't know. I, I'm still on the fence on ChatGP and, and also like I'm on the fence because anything I put there might become uh, their property. So I'm very uh, unsure of if I should even put anything there. I've been testing it, but I don't use it professionally and I don't use it on my productions yet. You know, I use a lot of machine learning from Nuke and from other softwares, but, but I don't really use that kind of AI assistant, no. Okay, I'm afraid I have to wrap things up there. But before I do, we can announce the winner for who got the license, and that is Edson Maley. Maley, um, apologies if I mispronounce your last name. So congratulations, we'll have one of the team come reach out to you and sort that up. Cool. I just want to finish by offering a massive thanks again to Hugo. He spends a lot of time and effort putting this information together and putting such an entertaining presentation with so much value. And thank you all for all your time as well to come and see it. So thank you everyone. Thank you.